governments really they have to make a policy where Africa will not only be supplying raw materials. The panel also featured the executive director of Oxfam, Winnie Yanjima, an ardent advocate for more active efforts to foster economic and social inclusion in Africa. For her, growing foreign investment in Africa has not always nourished prosperity. Six out of the ten countries that are most unequal are in Africa today. And what we are seeing is more and more citizen insecurity as we have in Latin America. And it is an expression of the majority of people feeling locked out of governance, feeling that the rules are rigged in favor of a few. And unless we address this question of inclusion, of creating jobs, both economic and political inclusion, I'm afraid insecurity will continue to rise. Certain presidents on the panel, Nigeria's Goodluck Jonathan and Ghana's John Dramani Mahama, noted building up the economies of the various nations remained a primary goal and a long-standing source of work. For Ghana's president, John Dramani Mahama, a lack of inclusion would prevent African countries from being truly secure. If you're taking products from Nigeria and bringing them to Ghana, you have to go through like five, six, seven border checks. And at every border check, the amount of money you have to pay, especially in illegal collections, is so much. And so it, it needs a certain political will to be able to do that. And I can see that that will is beginning to develop. In Dakar, um, a few months ago, we passed the common external tariff. And so that paves the way for us to start to create a free trade area. We need to take down the barriers, take down the border posts. One of the things we're doing is join border posts between our countries so that there's just one border post to clear. And the key problem where inter-African trade is limited is transportation infrastructure. Mm -hmm. For you to move from one African country to the other, sometimes you have to go to Europe, mm -hmm. go outside Africa for you to access another African uh, country. So we need and to talk to the airlines. Link, uh, yeah, of course, airlines, mm -hmm. rail system, uh, until you get these uh, road linkages, until you get the infrastructure in place. The political decision is simple. A president can just wave anything overnight. That until we get the infrastructure, inter-African trade becomes a uh, limited factor. President Mohammed. Right. We'll discuss Davo 2014 and Africa's next billion uh, later in the course of the program. But now let's talk about uh, the demolition exercise at Ajekuju and over 50 houses at Surha East in the area of the Tema West District were demolished uh, Wednesday. Matilda Wemega has been to the scene and uh, here's the story she brought us. Indeed, many of these families have been rendered homeless. They had to pass the night outside as a result of the demolition exercise carried out yesterday. Many of them are now in a dilemma, not knowing what to do or where to go from here. We'll be speaking to some of them briefly to find out what exactly happened here yesterday. The exercise itself was not peaceful. Our filming of the demolition exercise attracted the wrath of some of the people around. An official believed to be a member of the TDC tax force pulled out a gun from a polythene bag, firing a shot aimed at my cameraman, signaling him to stop filming. It was a run for life. <laughs> The heavy presence of the Joint Security Force alarmed residents as they looked on for their houses to be pulled down. The Member of Parliament for Tema West, which includes areas around Ajay Kujo, Natoshi Ado, expressed dismay at the exercise, saying she was not informed. We have always told TDC in TME that whenever you want to do things like this, consult some of us now. You're representing Kofono. Say the Bayer be Bienia, you know, the Baba Casa. Say yet negotiation be near Bayer, Sabi, and Nipa now beton as a cinema. And to say Nipa Yam from Swa, or Bietimia Sidine Amanet Lintel, 
where was TDC when they were building? We are going to go there and ask them for an explanation. Whatever it is for humanitarian reasons. As for me, I have a problem. I have a problem with TDC. It looks like TDC is interested in money and not people. This nearly resulted in a scaffold between the MP and some security personnel. So why don't you shoot me then? Why don't you? That is your speciality. Who do you think you are? Residents are still in shock, describing the destruction of their property without prior notice as unbelievable. Right now, what they have written on the walls, when we trace TDC, we can't see final warning and remove. We, we, we can't see it. So it's not formal. So they are using their position today. To, 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 to suppress those of us who are inferior in society. Some claim they have documents showing ownership of the parcels of land. We do the process from TDC to TMA. Did they give you approval? Yes, they give us approval. That's the document that I showed to you. Some of us, when we started the project, we have to inquire from TDC whether we can go on with the project. I, for instance, I went there, I met the task force leader, Anthony Kratus. So I asked him that I want to do some project over there. What should I do? He said there's no problem. I should go on and do the project. So Angry residents threaten to rebel and take the law into their own hands if the matter is not properly addressed. When they come and sit there, they, they, will, they will hear mass murder. They will hear mass murder, always. George Kofi Ameyao is the spokesperson for the family which sold out the land to the residents. So then if indeed see this, you think you, you lay claim to this property, what... What made you refuse to meet the MP of this area? What made you refuse to discuss with the assemblyman of this area? What made you refuse to notify the family who gave this land out? What, what made you refuse? Do you think that TDC, you are a law court of your own, you can decide one day that we are going to demolish the structure and demolish? Is that the kind of country we are living in? The way forward is this. TDC should be someone with a family. Everybody bring their document to prove once and for all who is the rightful owner of this land. That's all. Shattered and displaced, residents say all they want is to get their lives back. Matilda Pomaga for Joy News, Sraha East. And how are they coping with getting their lives back? That's what we seek to find out uh, on the program. Matilda Wemega is there at Ajay Kujo again uh, today, and she joined us over the telephone. Hello, Matilda. Hello, Kemini. Mm. And so how are they getting their lives back? Mm. Well, uh, for two nights sleeping outside and still counting uh, residents, they are still waiting for authorities to come out and speak to them. Well, what I gathered this morning is that the people of the area need Straha mm. to visit them any moment soon. So we are still waiting for him. We tried reaching the, the, the MP for the area, not so she is. He says she is in Accra trying to speak to the minister and the other people in the cabinet to find out how best to address the For residents, they are so stranded, knowing no where to go or, or what to yeah, so that is that is all we, we have that. Mm. I, 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 clarify this for me. Is the chief of the area the same person who sold the lunch to these people? Yes, me, yes. Mm. He is the same person who sold the lunch to the rest. And they have documents. They, they have documents finding ownership of, of, of this. So uh, one, one of uh, the leaders of the town told me they just had a, a message from the national security that he will be visiting them anytime soon. So what they have to do is to get their documents ready. So most of them have gone out now to make photocopies of their land titles to be given out to authenticate mm. the of, of the land. Mm. But what are the expectations of the chief's visit? Well, they, they, for, for what they are saying is that the chief should come out and speak out to them and tell them the real situation on the ground. Uh, because for, for them, what they need now is a compensation in their land back because they have invested a lot into getting this property. The next few down is just a day. So for them, all they want is to get their 
their lands back and get their compensation. But I understand the chief are also having a meeting, mm. so he will be joining us any moment from here. Mm. But we're going to uh, PD to speak to the authorities that to get their Right. While we wait on him, tell us really how these people are coping. They would have to bathe, they would have to eat, those who have jobs to do would have to go to the US. How are they doing all of that? Okay. For for kids around, I can tell you they're just playing around, not knowing what some I spoke to some of the kids to tell me they they for three days they haven't been to school because they can't even find where their school uniforms are. Uh, for mothers, they are just sitting outside under trees, hoping they were asking some of us for even money because they tell us everything they have has been grinded. They are able to even pack out something. And let me tell you, those uh, some residents whose houses have not yet been put down, uh, they have already packed out their things, praying that nothing of that sort happened to them. For them, they, they are they are just praying because their houses have not yet been put down. But where I stand, I can see the bulldozers are moving. Although security men are not around to as they were yesterday, the bulldozers are moving. And I'm sure that any moment they might start a, a, a demolition again, they might continue with it again. So I just see the bulldozers moving and then the people are just started here, not mm. knowing what to do, where to go from here. I see. T taking a casual look at the area, how many houses would, are likely to go down today? Yes, so on Tuesday, I'm told to speak. yesterday, over 30 houses were pulled down, so we are getting close to over 100 houses have been pulled down so far. Mm. And, 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 and I'm asking, taking a look at the area and, and the number of houses uh, or structures yet to be pulled down, how many do you think the voters will, will, will pull down today? Uh, well, we have counted about 10 houses which haven't been pulled down yet, which uh, families have already packed out of the house waiting for something like that to happen so for them they are just they are just standing and waiting to see what will be the next line of action mm. the, the the show will be some confusion uh between homeowners like uh landlords or landladies and the and their tenants because uh, i remember you were telling me wednesday that really some of the people had just moved into uh, exactly. the, the, the area so for people who are renting and are not really homeowners what are they saying to you well, for now, they, 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 there is nothing like a confusion. They are all consoling each other because it's, it's a loss. They have not lost out everything. So uh, there is nothing of that sort like confusion, just that they are all sympathizing with each other to find out how best to address the situation. If you see everybody here, they are all holding their, their land title, their, 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 their certificate, the things that claim ownership of the land. For them, they want their land and then a I see. Uh, let, let's talk about this uh, person believed to be an employee of the TDC who fired a, 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 a gunshot Wednesday. What's, what's been the situation with that person? Uh, for this morning, I haven't spotted him around, like I was saying. They, I, uh, they come in here with the security personnel, so I'm sure if the security personnel are coming here, they will be part of it. I haven't spotted him this morning yet. I, I understand his name is uh, Colonel Saliku. I, I don't know if that is true, but residents who saw that and saw us this morning, they were like, hey, you people are still here again. What they did to you yesterday was serious. So they gave me his name as Colonel Saliku. I've yet to confirm that. Yeah, like I, do. I see you, you, your line is breaking away. If you could reposition yourself so we wrap up on the conversation. Okay. Can you hear me? I, I can. I, I can. Okay. And I hope it stays, it stays that way. Uh, yes. so, children mm -hmm. are not going to school. Uh, parents are stuck at home. And yes. uh, I, I'm, I'm just wondering, really, yeah. give us a picture of... of of, of the lives of these people at the moment. Well, uh, where are I they can... bathing? Well, they are bathing under trees. That is what I should say now. Some are trying to salvage some of their things out of the debris. And for most of them, they are just sitting under the trees. And, and how, uh, long, how long do they think they can stay there? 
Uh, well, they, they tell me they have nowhere to go. Uh, those who have places to go have already brought in trucks to pack out some of their things that they were able to salvage. But those who do not have places to go are uh, just sitting under the trees here, chatting, investing among themselves to find out how best to address the situation. But for them, uh, all hope is not lost. They are waiting on their chiefs to come out and speak to them. So uh, we are still waiting. So when the chief comes around, whatever it is, we'll update you with it. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Matilda. Matilda Wemeka joined us from Saraha East in Ajekuju in the Tema West District. And uh, is uh, the aftermath of the uh, is the aftermath of the demolition at uh, the area in Ajikuju. Let's move on to F the FPSO in Kwame Nkrumah, where Ghanaians working on the FPSO at the Jubilee Fields are believed to be losing their jobs to expatriates. Executive Director of the Africa Center for Energy Policy, Mohamed Amin Adams, has uh, been responding to the possible implication of the situation on the local content agreement. Let's take a listen. We apologize for the lack of audio on that very interesting soundbite. Um, we'll work on it and then bring it back. In the meantime, don't go away. Don't forget also you can share your comments with me on our social media platform. So I'll be right back. Welcome back to News Desk. Now, Ghanaian President John Dramani Mahama said a lack of inclusion would prevent African countries from being truly secure. Speaking at the World Economic Forum Wednesday in Davos, Switzerland, President Mahama argued that while drawing in foreign investors was important, so too was promoting a homegrown business industry that would more directly enrich Africans. The World Economic Forum has one of its aims, inclusion. A panel discussion on Africa's future was held Wednesday in Davos, Switzerland. The discussion included two sitting presidents from Ghana and Nigeria. In a discussion on what the Africa of 2050 might look like, a number of participants took on the issue in different ways. They argue that opening and supporting more foreign investments would naturally trickle down to the populace. According to Nigerian-born billionaire Aliko Dangote, economic advancements such as a continent-wide common market would help. You know, going forward, now you say, okay, fine. If we are going to even grow at 4.5% for the next to 2050, which is about 37 years, it means that Africa will have a total GDP of about 9 trillion. 9 trillion, that's twice China today. And it can happen, it's possible. You see, but what we need to do is that the governments really, they have to make a policy 
where Africa will not only be supplying raw materials. The panel also featured the executive director of Oxfam, Winnie Yanjima, an ardent advocate for more active efforts to foster economic and social inclusion in Africa. For her, growing foreign investment in Africa has not always nourished prosperity. Six out of the ten countries that are most unequal are in Africa today. And what we are seeing is more and more citizen insecurity as we have in Latin America. And it is an expression of the majority of people feeling locked out of governance, feeling that the rules are rigged in favor of a few. And unless we address this question of inclusion, of creating jobs, both economic and political inclusion, I'm afraid insecurity will continue to rise. Sitting presidents on the panel, Nigeria's Goodluck Jonathan and Ghana's John Dramani Mahama, noted building out the economies of the various nations remained a primary goal and a long standing source of work. For Ghana's president, John Dramani Mahama, a lack of inclusion would prevent African countries from being truly secure. If you're taking products from Nigeria and bringing them to Ghana, you have to go through like five, six, seven border checks. And at every border check, the amount of money you have to pay, especially in illegal collections, is so much. And so it, it needs a certain political will to be able to do that. And I can see that that will is beginning to develop. In Dakar, um, a few months ago, we passed a common external tariff. And so that paves the way for us to start to create a free trade area. We need to take down the barriers, take down the border posts. One of the things we're doing is join border posts between our countries so that there's just one border post to clear. And the key problem where inter-African trade is limited is transportation infrastructure. Mm -hmm. For you to move from one African country to the other, sometimes you have to go to Europe, mm -hmm. go outside Africa for you to access another African uh, country. So we need and to talk to the airlines. Can, yeah, of course, airlines, rail system, uh, until you get these uh, road linkages, until you get the infrastructure in place, the political decision is simple. A president can just wave anything overnight. But until we get the infrastructure, Inter-African trade becomes a uh, limited factor. President Mohammed. Right. Uh, joining us over the telephone is uh, Sidney Casey Hayford. He's an economist. Thank you very much, Sidney, for joining us on News Desk. Thank you very much. Mm. Let's, let's start off with your general thoughts on the conversation we just had. Um, which part of the conversation? I, I heard several by Dangote, who is probably one of the best recognized uh, mm. uh, uh, wealthy uh, private entrepreneurs in the country today, in, the, in, in fact, in Africa. Mm. Uh, I heard Dr. Ma uh, President Mahama say something, and a few other people said... So right. No, 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 which I, part, mm. I, I think basically the conversation had to do with the, the lack of intra-trade among African countries and, and how it was necessary for political and economic inclusion, if really Africa needed to be secure. You know, I, I would like to say something specifically to that because um, we have been trying for decades, it's not years now, mm. but decades of alleviating the border flow between a particularly ECOWAS country in order to allow the smooth transition of trade and of passage so we can actually get business moving. Um, our economies are not big enough, except for South Africa and Nigeria, uh, to survive on their own to a large extent. So we in Ghana, for example, it's very difficult to really become a successful big millionaire or a big business person um, like Yangote has done in Nigeria, mm. simply because we don't have the market economy dynamic to be able to create a big thriving business. There aren't that many of us, so you need the ECOWAS trade region to kick in so we can actually work. Um, we did the West Africa gas pipeline. It, it, it is successful to a large extent, depending on Nigeria. We have the Trans ECOWAS Highway. It will be successful depending on Nigeria and Ivory Coast. We need to drop the border requirement. Uh, the USAID have been supporting uh, movements of box transport and haulage in the country. Mm. Uh, they call it borders without uh, allowance uh, without borders. It, all of these things. The frustration now is they have all been researched, they have been documented,
They have been funded, and yet we are not even implementing them. I think I heard President Mahama say that we are just buying uh, uh, the tariff treaty in Dakar, and he could see that the goodwill was coming. The question is for African leaders, how long will it take for them to actually get around to doing the things that they know are right and proper so that the people of Africa and West Africa particularly can actually get up, tap into it, and actually be wealthy and do something credible with themselves. It is only when you've been able to satisfy your basic needs and be able to reach a certain level of income and be comfortable that you start getting philanthropic and giving out to other people as well in a big way. You can do it in a small way as you're growing, but to be able to be generous and helpful, you need to have some kind of stability in your own personal life. So unfortunately, we are being satisfied with too many small steps and we pat ourselves on the back when we have achieved something which we could have achieved 20 years ago. Mm. Right. Now, like you said, these are things we already know. It's been happening several years now. And, and these are world leaders who, are, who, who sit there and talk about this. And yet you can't tell from, from their conversation any concrete uh, step that is, be, that, that, that is being taken to, to deal with the situation. Over the years, in trying to deal with this, what have we not got right? We haven't got the strong leadership and the strong focus and emphasis on the economy right. We are focused too much on political power. Our politicians have forgotten and or don't seem to realize that if they have a thriving, successful economy, they will keep winning the mandate of the people to rule the country. Everybody wants to at least have some kind of way to be able to live a normal life. I go to bed every night, there's water flowing through my pipe. I wake up in the morning and there's no water. It is so unpredictable and so unnecessary. And it's little things like that. In so many ways, we, we, we need to get ourselves situated locally and sort our problems out first. Every country needs to sort out its local situation. Nigeria has to sort out the Boko Haram issue. We have to sort out the potential inflammatory issues from up north. We need to sort out water electricity same thing in nigeria all of these things have to be fixed and they can be fixed when politicians and leaders start thinking straight instead of worrying too much about the vote count at the end of every period what is killing us is the need for people who go into politics wanting to perpetuate themselves until they die and this is where we are suffering Mm. On the other hand, uh, successful businessman Aliko Dangote thinks that, well, African, African governments, African leaders, government after government will support businesses. Now, it's left for the individual to, to not to wait on government to, to provide uh, the, the, the kind of environment it wants. Basically, we should also do something for ourse ourselves. For such a businessman, w the comment is made, uh, it's, 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 it's weighty. Uh, what do you think? I agree with Dangote 100%. But, you see, when you have something like we have now, we have just introduced a new, a new VAT bill, a new VAT bill. That VAT bill is placing enormous strain on industry. The bankers are going to talk to the president now. The pharmaceuticals are trying to engage them. Health is trying to engage them. Tourism is trying to engage them. Everybody can see that what we have done is not going to serve the purpose of economic growth. But we have it. It is difficult for me as a private person to go out there looking for work when the cost of doing business is so high. We are still paying between 30 and 35 percent interest on money that we borrow. You cannot survive in an economy like that. The Western world that we are trying to copy, that we think they have done so well, they focus strictly on business, small business, and the cost of doing small business. That way, a lot more family enterprises are born, a lot more people tap into markets, mm. and they give a lot of trade support and export support to anybody who can grow the economy of their country indirectly that way. What are we doing? We don't have that kind of policy. And when we have the policies and they are in place, we don't even encourage people to tap into them. We are setting up an infrastructure fund. Good. We need infrastructure development. We have an export development and agriculture investment fund, the EDAIF. The money is sitting there, and people don't go and borrow it because of the way the process has been set up. 
all we need to do is to focus on the processes, clean them out, and allow people the opportunity to be able to use them. If government doesn't do that, the private individual and the private business person cannot tap into it. So you cannot, you cannot make the system so rigid and then expect private enterprise to survive. It doesn't work that way. Mm. Right. I, for uh, businesses in, in, in the country, we've seen, we've seen here in, in Ghana how uh, public-private partnerships tend out. Mm -hmm. Situations like that do not create room for government, governments to want to do more, do they? But it's governments and government establishments who actually encouraged all the fraud in, in, in the private-public partnership. It wasn't perpetuated only by private private enterprise. The loopholes were made available, and, they, and, and it was exploited. As we sit down now, do we know who the true culprits are of the GIDA corruption scandal? We don't, because the investigation is not even complete. If government really wanted to reassure the people, it would expedite that system, that, that investigation, get the results out, you know, a, a, a crack the whip, show some people what it would be like if you actually continue to perpetuate that crime, and then we would all follow suit. So we have tried many, many ways to be able to define what we want to do. I remember the late Dan Latte with his domestication problem. I also remember Nana Fufaro putting out a paper which he called Indigenous Capitalism. I've heard Pakus Indum advocate a lot of free trade and free institutions. Abu, Sak Abu Sakara, when we had the uh, presidential debate in November of, of, of the uh, proposing year, he also indicated a lot, of, a lot of programs that are there. There are good ideas on the table. Our problem in this country is actually taking a situation, analyzing it intensely, and then implementing it and encouraging people to fall into it. Mm. We, are, we are lacking in the delivery. I, I know I keep saying it, but that is where we are lacking, and that's what we have to do. And we are underfunding institutions that are going to be able to champion those pro programs for us. And that's, that's where we are stuck. We are just not pushing enough and making things available for private enterprise to thrive. Mm. But there seems to have been a lot of optimism throughout the, the conversation. And from where you sit, do you see an Africa with very sustainable and all-inclusive growth in the future? I do, I do. And I think given five years, we will see a completely different landscape in Africa. But a lot depends on the change of government hands. We need to keep allowing other people to bring ideas. Let us judge them. Let us decide who is good and who is bad. When you have people who want to stay in power for 20, 25, 30 years, you have a problem. Thankfully, we in Ghana are not doing that. You have eight years maximum. If you don't perform, we will get rid of you. So in, in so many ways, Ghana has got that democracy right. But going forward, you don't only need Ghana to be fixed. You need Ghana, Nigeria, Ivory Coast, Senegal, all of ECOWAS need to have people who are dedicated towards trade and are dedicated towards fixing the economy and development. You cannot do it alone. We need a good South Africa. We need a good Botswana. We need so many key countries to actually do things the right way with us so we can all progress. So I think in five years it will come uh, if, if, if we have the right people in place and if we follow the right principles. But you see, now, knowledge is such that you don't need to start from scratch. You can leapfrog certain processes because others have tried and they have done it and we can all witness it and we have, have availability of material to look at all of these things. So we don't necessarily have to go through the whole process of 20 or 30 years like the Chinese and the Indians and the, the, uh, the, uh, the Singapore and the Malaysians did. We can see how they, 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 they survive. We need to leapfrog and move ahead. So if we can actually sit down and decide that we are really, really going to do certain things. I think we will make it in five years. Right. Thank you very much, Sydney. Uh, Sydney Casey Hayford is an economist, and we've been talking about the conversation on Africa's next billion, Davo 2014, uh, the World Economic Forum. And, um, well, I'll read some of your comments in, in a bit, uh, but uh, we'll move on to...
some other issues now. And Ghanaians working on the FPSO, Kwame Nkrumah, at the Jubilee Fields, are believed to be losing their jobs to expatriates. An executive director of the Africa Center for Energy Policy, Mohamed Amin Adam, has been responding to the possible implication of the situation on the local, local content agreement. Let's take a listen. Change your service company. And the new company uh, is also doing new recruitment and has also come along with expatriates. And therefore, some of the workers with the old company uh, have to be relieved uh, of their work. Uh, they don't understand why they should be relieved of their work. And, and that's the issue we are concerned about. If there is a change of, of company, what processes did they go through to uh, uh, sign a contract with a new company? Who knows about that? Is the Petroleum Commission aware uh, where Ghanaian companies given the opportunity, fair opportunity to bid for those contracts. And so this brings us to the issue of contract mining, where oil companies, you know, continue to give service contracts to their own subsidiaries. Yeah. Okay, I do not have the full details of the beneficial ownership behind the new company or the old company. And so I'm unable to go into the propriety or in, in propriety of, of the contract. But let's come to our law and the contracts. The contract we signed with the Jubilee Partners says that they should give preference to Ghanaians when they have the requisite qualification. When Ghanaians have the requisite qualification, let's give them preference. Which means that before you even work on the MPSO, you might have been deemed to have qualified for the job. Now the second thing is, if you are now uh, denied of that job, because you feel you have been discriminated against, because I understand some Indians and other nationalities have been brought into, into Ghana. Then we can resort to PNEC Law 84, which says that there shall not be any discrimination against any Ghanaian, you know, as far as uh, recruitment is concerned, as far as conditions of service are concerned. Okay, and on that note, you can seek redress in court, or report to the labor union, or even to the TUC. The reason you have to seek redress in court or report to the labor union is that the oil companies have signed contracts with all their workers that they will not form unions. And so unionism is not an account in the uh, uh, companies. And therefore, as a group, you are unable to take class action. And this is why if you feel you are discriminated against, you know, on the basis of PNDC Law 84, then you have a legal foundation to seek redress or report to the labor union or the uh, labor uh, department so that they can fight your case for you or go to court on your own and, and fight it. This is what I can say about that. I'm sorry. Then the, the second issue is about the laws not working. Do we reverse? <laughs> Unfortunately, the parliament makes a law. It is the law of this country. Okay? But laws also can be revised. Sometimes new laws come to repeal old laws. But there are people who are usually very conservative, who do not believe in you know, multiple or early revision of laws. Our industry, the oil industry is new in Ghana, and so the laws we have governing the industry are also new. Not many Ghanaians will agree you know, if we want to revise the laws because we, we barely have implemented them for three years. Uh, fortunately, the Ministry of Finance has recognized that uh, uh, with the Petroleum Revenue Management Act, there have been challenges you know, in implementing the, the law. And the ministry itself has decided to review the law. Yesterday, we had a multi-stakeholder forum here in Alisa Hotel to build consensus around the proposals that have been sent to uh, the ministry. And they didn't do it on their own. They also invited you know, inputs from the public. And some of us, civil society organizations and individual Ghanaians, made submissions to the ministry, as a result of which we organized the consensus building forum uh, yesterday. And so if we find that some of our laws are defective and will not seek the interests of our country, we have several options. To revise those sections of the laws that are defective and are not seeking our interests, just as we are about doing with the revenue management law, or we make a new law to repeal uh, the old law or amend section.
limitations of the existing law. And so there are many options left to us, but it would depend on our citizens. Because the ministry didn't just decide that they wanted to review. You know, we made so much noise. We, we raised issues about sections of the law which are not seen in our interest, which are not good at all. And, and, and so they have had to, they had to listen to us. And therefore, this is why I said that let's not look at the supply side alone. We should equally look at the demand side. If citizens are not empowered enough to recognize that something is going wrong and to demand for a redress or a correction of, of, of those wrong things, they are going to be with, with, with us. President John Mahama on Wednesday too opened the World Economic Forum session on Responsible Mineral Development Initiative. The initiative aims at helping countries uh, develop their mineral resources in a social and economically responsible manner. In his opening remarks at the session, attended by Liberian President Ellen Selev Johnson and Guinean President Alpha Conde, President Mahama said Ghana is seeking international cooperation to move her from a primary processor of mineral resources to a secondary one. We introduce a windfall tax, and yet they won't allow us to implement a windfall tax in our country. I mean, they threaten to lay off workers if we implement a windfall tax. And because you need the jobs, you know, and you don't want workers laid off, and then you're for your coerced to, you know, uh, go along. But increasingly, we're also talking about secondary processing. And if we are to create jobs for the young people who live in Africa and who are in the communities and who can create social problems, you know, for the mining industry, then we need to move some of that secondary processing into Ghana to create additional jobs for the young people to be able to do. We export bauxite in its raw form. And then we import alumina to feed our aluminum smelter. And then we export the aluminum and re-import aluminum to feed our aluminum industries. Sometimes it just doesn't make sense. He said Ghana still leaves her accolade as the Gold Coast, but the sector faces few challenges like illegal mining, which resulted in the deportation of about 4,700 illegal miners. I mean, government wants to take more royalties and more taxes. Communities want to see better developments, you know, around them. And the mining industries want to see uh, greater profits. The main challenge is with illegal small-scale mining. Mm -hmm. Incidentally, the big mining corporations, you know, have an identifiable reputation, and so it's easy to go after them when there's reckless mining. And we often make them post a bond to reclaim the land after they finish mining. But with the illegal small-scale mining, you know, that's where we have a difficulty. And recently we had an invasion of foreign nationals into the mining sector. And um, we had to carry out an exercise to evict them. We need technical expertise in how to regulate small-scale mining. And that is where the major threat, you know, to the environment uh, is in my country. President Mahama noted that apart from a number of legislation passed to inject sanity into the sector, there is the need for technical expertise to manage the system. The World Economic Forum in Switzerland is being attended by world leaders, businessmen and women. That'll be all for today on the program. Thank you very much for watching News Desk. My name is Kemini Nyamani Amana. Enjoy the rest of our programs. Goodbye for now.